Hello, thanks for being here. Um, I have two, I have a special announcement, which is that if I run out of slides before my time is over, then I'm going to take questions. So you can think of questions, and then at the end of my talk, you can raise your hand, and I'll call on you, and someone will run over to you with a microphone so you can ask me questions. And then if we run out of questions, then we're going to start the panel and bring Vitalik and Phil Zimmerman back up here earlier. Um, my name is Zuko. And uh, I, I'm the CEO of the company that makes Zcash. And this talk is going to be uh, about Zcash, but also about how everyone else can use the science that we've been developing in Zcash. Uh, and also, it's going to have something about regulations and why governments should uh, require encryption in all of the blockchain protocols in the future. So. Uh, Bitcoin is like HTTP, but it's HTTP for money, and it has something in common with HTTP, which is that if you use it, then uh, random hackers can see what you're doing because there's no encryption built into it. And this is something that Satoshi and Hal Finney and others knew about when they were building Bitcoin in uh, maybe 2009, 2010. They talked about this problem that it exposes the user's data, and they talked about how it if it would be possible to solve it with cryptography. But back then, in 2009 and 2010, they didn't, we didn't have um, good enough cryptography to solve this problem. And uh, Zcash is like HTTPS, which means the contents of what people do with it is encrypted and isn't visible to an unauthorized third party who sees it. Um, there's Something else that it has in common with uh, HTTPS, which is that uh, it kind of scares uh, law enforcement. When, when HTTPS was new in the 1990s, there were uh, some members of the United States government who thought that HTTPS might lead to crime, and they tried to ban it. And there was a great struggle and Phil Zimmerman, who we heard talk this morning, was a central figure in that struggle. Uh, but there were many people involved, and it lasted for at least 10 years, maybe 15 years of, of struggle about whether law enforcement or economics or privacy or other things are the more important values for society. And the only thing I want to point out about it right now is, uh, nowadays, the government requires that you use HTTPS to protect your customers. Um, every country has a law that says if your customers use your product for sensitive personal information, you're required to use HTTPS to protect them. So it changed over the course of about 20 years from potentially being banned to being required. And I'm going to get back to that at the end of this talk after we go through some science stuff. Um, something that I really like about Zcash is it's the first combination of the encryption properties, which means that uh, only specific selected people can see the data. That's what we call selective disclosure. That's what encryption gives you. Zcash is the first combination of selective disclosure with the blockchain properties of permanence. And my favorite use of this so far is for love notes. There, uh, shortly after Zcash was launched, Someone, a young person that I know, came to me, like a 20-year-old person came to me, and uh, said that she got a Zcash transaction, and in it, inside the transaction, there was a, a, an image file, and it was a scan of tickets to an event that she and her, a, 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 a trip that she and her boyfriend had been talking about taking. So it was an encrypted love note in the blockchain. And it's kind of like um, carving your initials on a tree and carving a love heart on a tree so it's permanent. But because of encryption, only you and your lover can see the love heart. Anyone else who looks at the tree just sees a tree. Um, and that's the best illustration of this unique combination of encryption and immutability or permanence in the same data structure. And then actually someone else told me that they exchanged wedding vows through the Zcash blockchain. So there's at least two couples in the world that have encrypted love notes in the Zcash blockchain. Um, but I haven't seen it because I'm not any of them. And only the people who are authorized to see it can see it. 
All right, now real quick, a dive into the science. Um, I'm really proud of Zcash for pioneering the use of zero knowledge proofs. Um, that's the, that was the missing ingredient that Satoshi and Hal were talking about in 2009 or so, was if we only had efficient enough zero knowledge proofs, we would be able to put encryption into Bitcoin. Uh, but they didn't have efficient enough zero knowledge proofs back then. But after that, some scientists figured out how to make zero knowledge proofs efficient enough. And the efficient ones are called SNARKs, uh, S-N-A-R-K. And Zcash version 1.0 launched in 2016. And that was, that's the version on the left here, the 1.0 version of Zcash. And that was the first large-scale, real-world deployment of zero-knowledge proofs. And it kind of proved the viability of the technology. And I'm really proud of that. I think much of the um, current crop of technologies and products that use zero-knowledge proofs for lots of other things, like the uh, ZK roll-ups that Vitalik was talking about, and um, the new zero-knowledge-based identity program that MasterCard announced last week, and, and, and many other um, zero-knowledge proof applications uh, only got their start because a couple of years ago, Zcash demonstrated that zero-knowledge proofs were practical. Um, and that was version 1.0 of Zcash, and it was barely practical. It was very inconvenient and unusable. Like Vitalik was saying at the end of his talk, we have a long way to go to make blockchains as usable as normal apps are. And so in the first version of Zcash, when you went to make a payment, you would hit the button to generate a new zero knowledge proof, and then you would have to wait for about 40 seconds while your computer, like, heated up uh, as it generated the zero knowledge proof. And then we worked on it for two years, and in 2018, last year, we released version 2.0, and um, that reduced the time you have to wait from 40-ish seconds to two or three seconds. And what I'm going to talk about now is candidates for version 3.0. Um, the first Version 1.0 and version 2.0 both use snarks, which is the top row here. And um, we have three different technical requirements we have to pay attention to to use zero-knowledge proofs in a payment system. So Zcash is a payment system a lot like Bitcoin style. It's like UTXO style. It's a blockchain. It's a single longest, heaviest chain proof of work blockchain. It's just like Bitcoin. And um, the first number, 2.3, oh, I can zoom. Oh, you can't see it anyway. Anyway, I'm pointing at the 2.3 up there. Um, that's how long the user has to wait after they tell it to do something before it's created a new transaction. Um, and when I'm going through all these numbers, I want to point out that they are different requirements for different applications. So I'm going to talk about the requirements that Zcash has, which is a Bitcoin-style payment system. But like I said, there's a lot of different applications of zero-knowledge proofs coming along. And different ones may be able to use different technologies because they have different um, performance requirements. The second one is how long it takes to verify that a zero-knowledge proof is correct. The um, requirement for that in a blockchain, well, a Zcash blockchain is uh, you have to verify, the if you're a miner and you're mining a block, you have to verify that all of the payments in the previous block are, are valid. And so you have to be able to do that really fast because if it takes too long, then you are at a disadvantage compared to a competing miner. And uh, we, we figure that seven milliseconds is fast enough for our purposes. Um, and then finally, the proof size is a string that has to be included with every transaction in Zcash. Um, and 200 bytes is OK. Uh, a transaction in Bitcoin is maybe 100 to 300 bytes anyway. And a transaction in Zcash is, uh, it's maybe 2,000 bytes because we make a lot of room for love notes. Um, so 200 bytes is fine. Uh, now there's. Two, two candidates for a new improved zero knowledge proof um, are Starks and Bulletproofs. And wait, no, go back. There. 
Um, you can't even see that laser, can you? Zzz. Anyway, I'm pointing at Starks. Starks are um, a, a new f a new mathematical technique for zero knowledge proofs that um, was invented after Snarks were, so even more, even newer. Um, and some the inventors of Starks are also some of the founders of Zcash, so it's part of our family tree. And Starks have a lot of interesting properties. Um, I'm going to get to this whole column called toxic waste mitigation at the end, because that's the interesting, complicated, difficult one. But first, I'm just going to go through the numbers. Starks have a lot of good properties. And they might be really good for applications where it's OK to use 50 kilobytes for one step of your application. And you can imagine there's lots of, of things you might want to use a zero knowledge proof for. Uh, one thing that they've said they're working on in the Starks uh, world is DEXs, where you might want to aggregate a whole bunch of um, bids and asks or other kinds of orders and compute uh, matching so that everyone is satisfied and gets a good deal. Uh, and then you might want to prove that the deal, that the matching you computed was correct. Um, and you might also have privacy properties. I don't know. It depends on the details of the DEX. But if you do all that, it's fine to take 50,000 bytes to show the results. But in Zcash, it's not fine to take 50,000 bytes to include with every single payment. Because um, like I said, Zcash transactions are a couple of kilobytes, maybe two or three kilobytes. So this, um, this size makes Starks be a non-starter for Zcash's purposes, even though they might be great for some other things. And the next candidate is Bulletproofs. Bulletproofs are. Um, they're really great technology because they're based on older, better understood cryptographic assumptions. Um, and they're widely used. They're used, um, they're implemented and supported by lots of different other cryptography teams in the, in the blockchain space. But there's two reasons why they won't fit in as a, as a drop in replacement for SNARKs. Uh, one is the proof time. If you click the button and you have to wait 15 seconds before you make a transaction, that can be annoying. And uh, much worse is the verify time for, for, for bulletproofs. They're used already in Monero for, um, for proving a simple fact that uh, a couple of numbers are within the right range. Um, and they can do that efficiently. But to prove a complicated fact, like that a Zcash transaction is fully valid would take far too long, and so we wouldn't be able to, uh, uh, wouldn't be able to um, verify a block full of those fast enough to do mining. So that's a showstopper that prevents us from using bulletproofs as a drop-in replacement in Zcash for now, unless somebody can figure out how to optimize these two things. <clears throat> but the proof size is pretty good, good enough on the order of a kilobyte. And now the new one that just came out most recently, and it's by Mary Maller and Sean Bow and some other co-authors. And Sean Bow is one of the cryptographers at, on, on the Zcash team. Um, it's called Sonic. And Sonic is pretty exciting because all three of the um, performance factors are, are good. Uh, are, they're good enough for Zcash, and that also means they're probably good enough for a lot of other uses because Zcash's performance requirements are particularly demanding. Um, well, it could take five seconds to generate a proof, which is mildly annoying, um, I guess. I'm not sure how, uh, what the real usability impacts are for two seconds versus five seconds versus one second. Uh, I guess we have to experiment with that. But it's all got really good performance. And now we get to the toxic waste mitigation part, because that's um, one of the very interesting things about Sonic. OK, now I have to explain about toxic waste. This is really a weird, complicated topic. Um, in SNARKs, there's this, so like I said, there, there wasn't any way to do zero knowledge proofs back when Satoshi and Hal were working on it in 2009 or so. 
uh, there wasn't any way that would be efficient enough to satisfy the requirements of something like Bitcoin. And Snarks was the first breakthrough that allowed something that efficient, but it came with a drawback, which is that Snarks have a, uh, there is a number which if anyone knows that number, they can forge forgeries. They can generate forgeries. And we started calling that number the toxic waste, and I'll explain why in a second. <clears throat> Now, if you can generate forgeries, that ruins the point of a zero-knowledge proof. The zero-knowledge proof is supposed to be a proof that proves the correctness of something uh, without disclosing information unnecessarily. But if you can generate forgeries, then you're not proving the correctness of something. The way that, hap that, way that the effect that has on a payment system like Zcash is, if you can generate forgeries, you can counterfeit Zcash. And uh, nobody can tell because everything is encrypted and you have this really great privacy. Uh, therefore, if anybody can generate forgeries and counterfeit Zcash, no one will be able to know that this happens until like, there's so much Zcash flowing around the world that the price goes down and, and everyone realizes like, at some point like so much Zcash gets deposited to exchange or something that people realize it's been counterfeited. It's really hard to tell. Um, so this is a huge, like, critical danger. And so toxic waste mitigation is how do you make sure that nobody knows the secret key which would allow them to counterfeit. And so what we did with Zcash, um, since back then all we had was snarks, we did this thing called a one-time multi-party computation ceremony where we got well, the first time we did it in Zcash 1.0, we got six different people, each with their own computer, and each computer was going to be responsible for what's called a toxic waste precursor, and it wouldn't be, you can't generate the toxic waste unless you can get the precursors from all six of the computers and put them together. And each uh, of the six people who are involved in this ceremony went out on the day of the ceremony and bought a brand new computer off the shelf in a, in a random store and uh, just took it in their arms and then didn't let it out of their sight. Uh, and this is a way to make sure that nobody has like backdoored the computer. Like if you ordered it to be delivered in the mail, then there's a thing called a supply chain attack, which is... Uh, somebody knows what you're doing, so they intercept the computer in the mail and they put a back door, hard, hardware back door or something into it. To prevent that, everyone had to go buy a fresh computer off the shelf in person and then not let it out of their sight. And then before ever turning the computer on, you open it up with a screwdriver and you rip out the radios, like the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth and any communications, radio communications devices out of it. And then you never, never plug the computer into an Ethernet cable. So this computer never gets connected to a, net, to a network of any kind for its whole life, from the time it was bought until the time it's going to be destroyed in fire at the end of the story. And so then the six people each do this computation on their air-gapped, isolated computers, and we collect the results of their computation and then those results get baked into the Zcash blockchain so that we can make efficient zero-knowledge proofs. And as long as nobody managed to steal the precursors out, oh, and then, and then the computer gets destroyed by fire. So you do the computation, you generate the resulting public parameters that are gonna go into the blockchain, and the secret precursor, which is dangerous, is only inside your computer. So then you take like a hammer and like a blowtorch and whatever and you destroy the computer to make sure that no one can ever recover the secret precursor out of it. That was Zcash 1.0. And that wasn't good enough. It was probably the best cryptographic ceremony ever performed, I suspect, in terms of how difficult it would be for some like ninjas to like sneak in and insert backdoors into all six of the computers in different countries at the same time or whatever. Um, but even though it was the best cryptographic ceremony ever performed, it still really wasn't good enough because for one thing, someone else who wasn't there can always say, 
actually, you didn't do any of that. You just made it all up, and you're all six, like, in cahoots, and you actually all six collected the six precursors and generated the toxic waste, and you're counterfeiting Zcash. So that wasn't good enough. So then in Zcash 2.0, we did it about one order of magnitude better, which was that there was about 80 people involved, and anyone who was reading the right mailing list could join, uh, and they could submit their component of the resulting parameters that would get baked into the blockchain. So only if all 80 of these people were colluding together, or if some ninjas hacked into all 80 of their computers, then they could counterfeit Zcash, and that's like even better than the best cryptographic ceremony ever performed, but I kind of think it might not be good enough because now, like that was a whole year ago, and now people can say, well, I wasn't there a year ago. I don't even know if those 80 people really did that. Maybe all these people are, who claim to have done it were all part of a giant you know, show. It's all theater. So that's why I continue to be interested in new zero-knowledge proofs which don't have this toxic waste property. And Starks and bulletproofs, and, and again, I'm proud of Zcash for getting zero-knowledge proofs like proven to be useful. I also think they proved that people are gonna be suspicious of this toxic waste stuff, and so they spurred, Zcash's launch spurred research which led to these toxic waste free alternatives. So Starks and Bulletproofs, there's just no number. It doesn't matter if you know any number, if you know all the numbers, this will not allow you to forge any proofs. So that's great, that's the best thing, except they don't fit into Zcash for performance reasons. So Sonic is the new one that fits into Zcash and therefore it can probably fit into most applications requirements, or at least many. And it has this interesting, pro oh wait, go back. Updatable universal. Updatable universal, so updatable means you can, someone new can come along and they can say, I don't know if the original ceremony to prevent toxic waste was done correctly or if everyone who came before me was all part of a conspiracy. And then they can add their own contribution. So they can update the zero knowledge proof parameters with their own uh, public parameter contribution. And that means uh, nobody can generate the toxic waste without their precursor. So you could imagine like in a blockchain, you could potentially have this get updated by the miner with every block, or you could have a new ceremony with more and more people joining once a quarter or once a month, or something like that. That might, that's not as good as toxic waste free. There's still the theoretical potential of toxic waste, but it's almost as good because anyone who comes along and says, I claim that there is toxic waste, you can just tell them, okay, update the parameters, and as soon as you've updated the parameters, now you know there is not toxic waste because it would require the precursors from every single person who ever updated the parameters in order to generate toxic waste. Okay, it's kind of hard to explain. So uh, Toxic Waste Free is a much easier brand name, so that's a trade-off. But the last feature of Sonic is universal, and that's intriguing. It means everyone in the world can use these parameters for all of their zero-knowledge proofs. You don't have to do your own ceremony in order to use this zero-knowledge proof system. And I think that's really interesting because a lot of the zero knowledge proof systems that we've heard about, like the ZK rollups um, and a whole like dozen or other projects that have come along that have been like following in Zcash's footsteps and are using snarks, they have a huge problem, which is that they have to do a ceremony um, or their use of snarks will be uh, vulnerable to forgeries, which will destroy their security properties. Um, with Sonic, if, if everyone uses Sonic, then um, everyone benefits from the security parameters that everyone else generated. That's what it means by universal. So it's possible if, um, it's possible that Sonic will become kind of the standard zero knowledge proof system that most people use um, 
because it fits more of the performance requirements of more different applications, and the updatable universal feature means that you don't have to worry as much or do as much difficult work to ensure the security requirements of it. All right, that's Sonic. Thus ends uh, the science part. I wonder if anybody thought of any questions, because I'm almost out of time and I'm not finished with my slides, so I better hurry. All right, I'm excited about Sonic, but uh, we'll see. There might be something else, yet another new zero knowledge proof system someone else will invent this year that will be even better. All right. I've been going, this is now switching, done with science, enough of science, now we're gonna talk about regulation. Um, I've been going around uh, meeting with regulators from different countries and arguing to them that they should like skip ahead a decade and don't be like the United States government or like the NSA was in the 1990s and try to stall progress for 10 years. Instead, let's skip right ahead and go on to improving progress. And here's my argument. You're a regulator. You're, if you're the regulator of South Korea, you regulate exchanges. That's the, that's the, those are who your rules apply to. Your rules apply to exchanges. And almost all users who use cryptocurrencies for anything, they do it through exchanges. So this slide is all about exchanges. It's not about actual peer-to-peer -peer use of cryptocurrencies on your own phone. If you're citizens in South Korea, remember, you're the regulator of South Korea now, right? If, uh, if your citizens in South Korea are logging onto an exchange and they're using an unencrypted blockchain like Bitcoin or Ethereum, then uh, you can trace this blockchain using tools like Chainalysis, and you like that as a regulator of South Korea. You like to be able to keep tabs on what the citizens of South Korea are doing with the, with the exchange. But if you think about it, you would not like for the governments of other countries to be able to see what the South Koreans are doing on the exchange. Like France, Russia, USA, all the, all the other countries get just as much insight. And in fact, everyone else, random criminals, jealous ex-boyfriends, ex-girlfriends, advertisers, uh, foreign intelligence agencies, everyone in the world gets to see the same thing you get to see. Oh, regulator of the blockchain industry of South Korea. Okay, what if instead the South Korean citizens are logging into an exchange that's located in a different country, like Binance, which is located in Malta, and they're using an encrypted blockchain? Well, you've got a problem now. You don't know what they're doing because they're making it, it's like HTTPS. They're making an encrypted connection to Binance and only Binance and them know what was happening there. Um, and unfortunately, the government of Malta knows what's happening there, but the government of South Korea doesn't. But at least all of the jealous ex-lovers and whoever and the insurance agents can't see what's going on. Okay, what if you have a local exchange located in South Korea and the South Koreans are logging onto that, and they're using an encrypted blockchain. Now here's the thing that most people don't think through at first. You're the regulator of South Korea, right? You can see what they're doing. This is, this is the smiley face. This is, if the South Korean citizens are logging onto a South Korean exchange and they're using an encrypted blockchain like Zcash, the regulator of South Korea can see, can have access to their activities in order to monitor that. That's what a lot of people don't understand, but I assert that that's true. But the government of Malta can't, and all the other parties which your laws forbid those other parties to see the financial activities, they can't either. So, oh, my time's off. So, I go around arguing to regulators, look, if you think it through, you should require exchanges in your country to support encrypted blockchains so that you get information as the government of that country and foreigners and criminals and unauthorized third parties don't get that information, which is what happened with HTTPS after 10 or 15 years of struggle. And rather to my surprise, the first government that I told this to, which was the government of New York, agreed and they made Zcash one of a handful of coins which is 
whitelisted and allowed to be used in New York because um, they found this to be a compelling argument. The end. Do we have time for questions? Uh, just maybe one or two. Are there any questions? You can't ask a question. You're going to be up here on a panel in two minutes. <laughs> Is there any questions from anyone who's not going to be up here on a panel in two minutes? If not, we can go ahead with the panel. And then he can ask his question. There's a question. Oh, wait, there's a question. There's two. No, no, that one first. That one first. You, you raised your hand first. Make her ask. Um, so straight as fast as possible. Um, so you gave a, a local regulator and foreign and so on and so forth. So you're going to create sort of a, a regulators can protect their users within their own country. But what about the individual? Um, can an argument be made? Uh, uh, can you please make the argument, hopefully, that the individual can at least protect themselves within their own society, at least, with using the same technology? I love that question. That's an awesome question. I think the real answer is wait for the panel after the break, because uh, Vitalik and Phil Zimmerman and Phil Gladwell are going to come up, and they might answer it better than I would. But it's a really great question. I totally agree with the implication of that question. Now, that guy had his hand up. Uh, hello. So do you have any specific reason why you only use zero knowledge protocol instead of uh, combining other cryptographic protocols such as uh, homomorphic encryption, ring signature, or even blind signature? So yeah. you can have a price per performance yeah. combinations. Yep, we, we, did, um, we did compare those different technologies. Um, and zero knowledge proofs were the only one that had complete security. Um, the, the other ones have like uh, fragile or uncertain security properties. And we're a bunch of cryptographers, like we cut our teeth on like HTTPS and BGP and things like that, where cryptographers have always been like culturally, we have this idea that it's like 100% or die. Like you have to have something which the NSA and a million years of a million supercomputers and whatever, quantum computers, nothing can ever break it. And the zero knowledge approach is the only one that gets close to that level of security in a blockchain. And it has a bunch of trade-offs, like the, zero, the toxic waste trade-off is a huge headache, and then the performance trade-offs from that other slide are all big headaches, but we went for it because we wanted to make security be like the, the, uh, the thing that we couldn't compromise on. That was two. Oh, oh there's a question over there. Can someone give him a microphone? I'm just going to keep doing this till they drag me off stage. Uh, hi, my name is Praneet Kumar. I'm co-founder of Global Blockchain Foundation. We are a non-for-profit who is advocating uh, regulation around crypto economy, especially in developed and developing nations. Hmm. And right now, our area of operations is Southeast Asia. We have hmm. done some good work in Malaysia, and the result hmm. is visible. But uh, we feel, especially in the Southeast Asian context, that because of legal impediment, a lot of development and adaption is... Uh, not able to form. Mm. So in this case, leaders like you, how can organizations like us work together, leverage the wisdom, and connect with these governments, not in silos, but as a, uh, as a well-represented uh, stakeholder organization, mm. and take the full, because once you unleash a country like India, and you unleash the country uh, with the wrong policy or something, it is, un it is not easy to control. Hmm. So is there a guideline, not a law immediately, but at least a guideline that we can all adhere to, yeah. which we can promote? Because the economy is a great platform. They have done great work. Okay, so, so uh, I approve of the desire. I think it would be great if the cryptocurrency slash blockchain industry had a common um, recommendation, like a unified voice of what they recommended to different governments, like in Southeast Asia. Um, At least but, a guideline. 
not a law law. Yeah, but yeah. At least a guide. If we could even just have we, and it's a, it's too early. It's too early days. Um, everybody has different opinions and ideas, and we don't have time to learn about each other's stuff. So this this presentation was my attempt to inform a whole bunch of people. Um, and one thing that I hope, I think was surprising and I hope you all paid attention to was not only do I have this argument, here's my argument, I think it's really a great argument, but what's really surprising is that these people thought it was a persuasive argument. And so that's encouraging that maybe we can skip the 15 years of policy struggle and skip straight on to the innovation. That's my answer. Oh, this and, will be the last nope. oh, question. Then there's got to be this one over here. <laughs> that one. You can ask me offline. Mm -hmm. Hi. I was wondering, how do you envision regulators uh, utilizing ZKPs for proof of compliances, setting Ooh. the parameters for themselves. Yeah, that's a really neat idea. You could use zero knowledge proofs. There's zero knowledge proofs, Zcash is like in production, it's the first real complete use. And then there's like at least a dozen or more um, new products that are sort of in like development or like almost or early production or whatever. And then there could be a whole explosion of all kinds of uses, like zero knowledge proofs should be able to do almost everything you want. For example, if you want a policy that says um, every you know operation that you do in your business satisfies this huge list of rules um, that my you know regulator has devised, you could use a zero knowledge proof to demonstrate that, and that would be. You which, mean of the technologies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she what, said what which, which technology? implementation for that to happen? Oh, um, that's a really great question. Which one of these would be best for that? I'm not sure. Is there, and there might be others that come along in the next year or two that would be better. My, honestly, my first answer when I look at it is Starks. Um, because the scalability properties, Starks take this large size, like hundreds of bytes, hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of bytes. But then you can prove like basically arbitrarily complicated things in one proof of that size, which might be a good fit for these, this regulation. Um, although also Sonic, which is newer, might turn out to be better in like a year or three.